like I said before, if you haven't figured this out already, here at Calvary South Denver, we love teaching God's Word. We love it. It's an emphasis and a staple that makes us what we are as a church. I mean, uh, with you guys, we've studied numerous books, even before my uh, before I became the pastor, my dad was pastoring the church, but we, we as a church, we've gone through the book of Ephesians, we've gone through Acts, we've gone through Jonah and Ruth and Genesis and First and Second Timothy, and then like I said, next month we're going to start the Gospel of John. And the reason why I'm prefacing that to start off with is because we want as a church to be known in this community not just for loving God's word, but we want to be known in the community that we are sound and we are doctrinally sound when it comes to presenting God's word. Because anyone can announce, I love God's word, but once you get down to the nit and gritty of their doctrine, that really tells the bones of what they believe in. And we want to, we want to teach sound doctrine here as a church. And really, the church in general exists, which is a completely different language than... I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put us in the category because we are the Western church. We don't exist just so that we can have working projectors every single week, comfortable seats, and hear a guy teach for uh, 40 minutes. We, my job as a pastor is to equip the saints for ministry, to get you excited for God's word. It's not to entertain you. It's not to do silly uh, impressions up here and make you laugh, although that is a part of my personality. My job as a pastor is to make sure that you understand the word of God so that you can tell others about it. Otherwise, we're plain church. And otherwise, what we're doing here is nice, but really, I want, I want to be a part of something that has eternal value. I want to do something that allows me to go to bed at night and say, Lord, did I do everything today for your glory? Did I accomplish what you gave me for the time that I had for today? And that's why we want to make our mark in this community as a church that loves God's word, that's going to teach God's word, sound biblical doctrine. And that's why I'm hoping collectively as a church, we can start asking ourselves the question, okay, if there's a lot to be done and you're about to talk about it, John, what we should be asking as a church collectively right now is how can I accomplish all the things that we're going to talk about with the little time and little resources that I have? It's kind of daunting as I'm looking at some of you. Some of you are like, I barely made it to church today. <laughs> That's all you're going to get, John. Hear me out. We're going to talk about three things this morning. Number one, making time for the Lord. Number two, managing our time for the Lord, and finally, giving our time to the Lord. Those are the three things we're going to talk about before I invite everyone up to talk with you guys. So right off the bat, let's talk about the first point, making time for the Lord. I'm going to read from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along or just look on the singular screen. It says this. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Focus on verse 4, because this is what I'm going to highlight. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Do you guys remember that old song, Time is on my side? Time is on my side. Yes, it is. It's like a fun song, but it's like the most obnoxious lyrics because it's like, time is not on my side. I feel like, if anything, time works against me. I feel like there is not enough time in the world or on my side to allow me to accomplish all the things that I need to make. And then, really, because it doesn't, honestly, because it feels like we don't have enough time in the day, we'll say things like, and especially as you get older, I wish I had more time for whatever. I wish, I, not, not only I wish, you know what, I need to make more time uh, for my family. I need to make more time 
uh, for my health, my responsibilities, and if, there's an, and if there's an available time, even after all the things that I want to do, then I'll make time for the church. And I've come to realize that co- time itself is constantly working against me. Does anyone else feel this way? Especially this week, maybe? You just feel like, I cannot do all the things I need to do. And I point all of this out to show a fundamental priority that Jesus just told us in John chapter nine. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because the night is coming that no one can work. The context in this particular passage are the disciples because of this cultural upbringing that if someone's born with some ailment, it's because they sinned. It's because the parents sin. The reason they're going through what they're going through is because of a sin issue. And for Jesus, he didn't have the time to really cover the fallacies of the Jewish culture's thinking. In fact, the first thing he points out as they're asking a a, a very real serious question, he answers it in a way that's like, guys, listen, time is running out. And in fact, I'm going to demonstrate my power through this man. And Jesus is going to heal his blindness. But then he says, because the time is coming when no one can work anymore. He's giving them this fundamental principle, like you're you're worried about whose sin, and that's not even the core issue. What you should be thinking about is the time that we have, the time that I have to demonstrate my power, which is why he made that important statement, I must work. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about the responsibilities I have as a pastor, as a husband, as a dad, where I'm asking myself the question, and I have lately, am I going to use today to glorify the Lord, or is there something else that's going to distract me? have a lot of distractions right now because more often than not the issue is not whether or not we have time for something the issue is whether or not we're going to prioritize what God wants us to focus on which leads to my second point managing our time for Jesus I'm going to read from Luke chapter 9 now Luke 9 57 through 62 it says this now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus said to him, look at Jesus' response. He doesn't say like, that's the coolest thing I've heard. Come this way, brother. I'm going to follow you wherever, Jesus. Jesus said, well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me... First go and bury my father. And then Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell who are at my house. And then Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Think about your boss that you work for and wonder if he or she is a very hard-working boss and puts a lot on you. Jesus, I want to follow you. Let me, let me bury my dad first. Let the dead bury their own dead. If you want to follow me, follow me now. I'm pointing out this passage of Scripture to show a very real reality that each of us have responsibilities. In fact, if we can recognize that our tasks that are before us daily that I'm going to use it to glorify the Lord or I'm going to use it to do my own thing. If you're, any of you are like me, and I'm not going to say I am perfect at this, and my wife will tell you, I am learning the art of managing my time better because for me, I overcommit. I say yes to everything, and I get in trouble because as much as I think time is beyond 24 hours in a day, the reality is... I have been seen for me, I need, a, I need to be a good steward to prioritize my time. 
and as many of you know, because there's not enough time in the day to do all the things that are on our plate, the issue really, it can't be that there's not enough time in the day. The issue is that we need to learn a very powerful word that many of you do not want to incorporate into your vocabulary. You want to know what that word is? Say no to things more often. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm more of a yes, Lord, yes, Lord, Christian. Wherever, but the problem is, and, and, and all joking aside, because we feel bad, we don't want to say no to things. And I'm looking at this passage where Jesus had numerous people that want to follow him, and he kind of prompts them, if you want to follow me, this is what it takes. This is what it's going to mean. So now, as you're looking through it, and you're like, I need to make time for the Lord. I need to manage my time for the Lord. And and listen, once those two things have been mildly accomplished, what's the next thing we should do? Okay, I've, I've made time, I've managed time, then we need to give time to the Lord. I'm gonna read from Matthew now. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. Amen. If we as a church exist to win people to Christ, like if we can agree on that, okay, then that tells me that the priority that's before us isn't just going to church on Sundays. It's understanding the gospel so that we can not just win people to Christ. You ready for the next hardest thing that no one wants to talk about? Disciple people. I am talking, I I was talking to Adam about this last night. We were up late talking about this. I love, as I'm looking at all of you right now, I love pastoring this church. I love you guys. I'm so thankful that you're in my life You minister to me and my wife and my kiddos and my staff. I'm so thankful for you. And I'm so thankful that God's put you in my life in this time to help bear burdens, to be a voice of wisdom for me. But if I'm going to be completely honest with you, what what gets me excited isn't necessarily filling these seats up with Christians. I love that. What gets me excited is the thought of getting unbelievers in this building and sharing the gospel with them. And I'm talking not just teach from up here, man, good message, I'll see you next week. I'm talking, I I wanna be a part of people's lives and answer really hard questions. I wanna see people wrestle through the word and struggle with certain doctrinal texts and ask questions so we can talk through it. But you know what gets me even more excited? When I see that you guys are doing that. When I see that you're getting down to the knit and gritty, you're crawling through the mud through people that have broken marriages, broken health, messed up lives, and you're the one who's up with them late at night, early in the morning, and God's using you to minister to them. And then you tell me about it. And all I'm thinking is like, Lord, thank you. If the goal of a church is to win people to Christ and make disciples who make disciples, and if we can all agree, as the Bible says, that no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, then that tells me, number one, Jesus is coming back. And it tells me I don't know when. And there are indications to show that it's sooner than later. So then that tells me that the priority of the Great Commission isn't just a concept. It has to be now. That now is the time to rise. And what makes today so unique and about what we're about to transition to I want you guys to understand that I want, I want to see our church healthy. And I'm not just talking numerically. And 
and I'm not just talking economically. I, I'm talking, I want to see us as a church fall in love with the word of God and find as many unbelievers as we can to minister to. And like a lot of you that are going to probably talk to me afterwards and say, John, I work three jobs. I barely can make it here. And what you're going to suggest to me is impossible. In a moment, I'm going to invite the crew to come up. But before I invite them to come up, I really, and, and afterwards, we're going to, as a church, pray together. And I want to challenge you guys t- to pray about fasting with me to do the things that we're talking about, meaning the practical things around the church that's needed for us to live. In fact, who here is very uh, excited about our current economic inflated economy? (laughs) Who loves going to the gas station and say, I am so glad gas is like $2 more than it was last year or a couple years ago? In fact, I don't see everyone. I'm, I'm going to tell this story. Uh, Adam, Deb, and Gavin, if you guys can make your way up here. And um, I want to, uh, yeah, uh, you guys make your way up here and let's talk as they're making their way up here so there's not an awkward, like, in between. Because of the reality of the economic inflated economy we're living in, as most of you, nod with me if you're doing this, who here has had to change their budget at home? to correspond with your earnings so that you can live as a human being. Who's done that? Yes, everyone's done that. I've done that. We've all done that. Um, What we're going to talk about as everyone's making their way up here is just as we, the Dracy family, have had to make budgetary changes as a home, we as a church are also having to make budgetary changes to support our tithe to cover operation costs. And so what I wanted to do is have these guys come up and we're gonna talk about what that looks like as a church, what our goals are as a church, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pray together as a church so that we can see those goals accomplished. And so everyone, we have one, two, three, and four. Uh, I'm gonna just introduce everyone. Uh, Here, we're gonna have, is Adam gonna sit next to me? Sweet. Here on my right is Miss Deb Lowry. Deb Lowry is our business manager here at the church who, like, let me put it this way. Aside from her financial expertise and numbers and accounting, she's the reason I don't end up on the news for bad reasons. So if you always wonder, like, John shouldn't be the pastor because he's young. Like, Deb's the reason why I haven't had to resign. So can we thank Miss Deb Lowry here? Next, we have Mr. Gavin Chavusti. Gavin serves on our board. He's our treasurer for the board of directors. Uh, Gavin has been, you know, the funny thing about Gavin and the Chavusti family is when we first moved back, he was one of the young families that I saw and I just like cornered. And I was like, we should be friends. And uh, he was in kind of this transitional time that he, they were thinking about leaving the church. And I'm so thankful that they didn't because Gavin brings insight and wisdom to the board that is much necessary. So will everyone welcome Mr. Gavin Chavus to you. Also, just to give everyone a heads up, those who serve on our board is Gavin Chavusti, myself, Brian Michaels, who's the pastor of Springs Lighthouse in Colorado Springs, and uh, Clay Warrell, who's the CGN director and uh, of of CGN, who lives in Costa Mesa, who is also the brother-in-law to Adam Dobbs. And then, of course, you all know our executive pastor, Adam Dobbs, who taught last week. Weren't you guys blessed by his teaching last week? So here, here we are. I feel, I feel like Johnny Carson right now, like, oh, like, hello, everyone. That was a terrible Johnny Carson impersonation. It was really bad. Usually I'm, I'm cue for that, but... What we're gonna talk about today is to kind of give you a glimpse of where we're at as a church. Um, Most of you understand that when you create a budget, if you as a family don't create budgets, oh dear God, you need to start doing that. And for us as a church, we've been doing it for the last 30 years. And generally what we do is we look at the last 10 years 
of the giving trend as a church to see what would happen uh, in the past to project what we do for the future. So for 2023, we looked at our 2021 and 2020 budget. As most of you know, when the world shut down, the economy was weird. That was weird. That was a very weird. Nationally speaking, the church saw in growth in the giving for 2020. But as most of you know, we make the decisions based off of prior years. I'm pointing that out so that you understand a couple things. Number one, our 2023 budget that we created is based on what happened in 2022. And what we're going to do right now is kind of explain to you that because of the economic inflated economy that we're seeing is choke holding everyone nationally, that we as a church have to make economic budgetary changes to support giving to cover operation costs. And so what I'm going to do is stop talking for a moment I'm gonna let these guys share, and I'm gonna have Deb Lowry kind of give the hard numbers. Um, if you guys have questions afterwards that you may have, uh, I believe we'll have Deb's email or mine on the screen that you can email us direct questions if you need to, because uh, we're talking about a lot of big things. And like I said, this is not a normal church service. so. For those of you who are very squirmy, like, this is weird. It is weird, but at the same time, I'm really excited that we're calling this a family meeting so that you can know what we have to do as a church to make the changes that we have. So with that said, um, before I hand off the mic to Adam, I'm gonna let him talk first. Um, I have always said that sarcasm is a spiritual gift because it is, and um, we used to have a lender for the, the note on our facility. Our facility, we owe about $1.8 million. And I remember using a sarcastic remark to someone that essentially became our private lender who holds the note for the church. And this person said, I'm looking for investments, what do you think? And then I jokingly said, well, there's this church called Calvary South Denver, and it'd be really great opportunity for you to see awesomeness happen or something to that effect. And this person called me back and basically said, hey, what if I carry the note and give you a 3.5% interest and what you pay in interest, I give all back to missions. So for those of you who don't know, we as a church have a private lender that we pay the principal and the interest each month at a 3.5% and this person basically gives yearly $60,257 towards missions. Isn't that amazing? We as a church pay roughly $126,000 a year between principal and interest. And for those of you who understand commercial, um, the, mar the commercial market right now, a 3.5 interest rate is a joke. That doesn't exist. So this really is God's favor for, on us as a, as a church that we've partnered someone that is not a corporate trying to squeeze you for every penny, but has partnered with us and said, I, I want to see God use you and I want to invest in you financially. And in fact, every penny you give it doesn't go towards me, it goes towards missions. So praise be unto God. So with that said, I'm gonna stop talking for a second. I'm gonna let Adam kind of share with you what it looks like to run a 40,000 square foot plus facility with only six staff members. This is gonna be fun, here we go. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Um, and, and just to add, maybe you said it and I tuned out for like half a second, but um, the, the, the private lender, uh, when we refied, we, we refied with them uh, just earlier this year, yeah? Or, or legit late last year, so coming up on a year. He uh, was advised by his board to increase the interest because to keep it at 3.5% is absolutely crazy, and he refused to do that. And so we're incredibly thankful, incredibly thankful for Sarcasm. that. Sarcasm. 90% of sarcasm is probably not a spiritual gift. <laughs> but just to kind of bounce off that, interest yeah. in current market, if we were going to a public lender, would be 10 to 12% on commercial. So 
three and a half is incredible. It's un, yeah, it's unbelievable. Anyways, so uh, w with that said, so when we refied uh, with with this private lender, we were able to uh, receive somewhere around five hundred thousand dollars to do. Uh, building improvements and and with that you guys saw the or you guys can now see the beautiful parking lot that we were able to do and that was one of those things that we were like eh, man, like maybe we can get by and maybe we could not to get kind of push that off for a little bit but then insurance came and was like no nope, you have to do it and we're like okay Lord where are we gonna get two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and he was like I got you and so we were able to do that because of that that refi uh, the, this facility is uh, is a lot. 40,000 square feet is a lot of facility to manage. And, and I did the math. For six staff members, six and a half staff members, that's roughly uh, just a little bit over 6,500 uh, square feet per staff member to manage. Imagine having to clean uh, a 6,500 square foot house. That's a lot. And when I did that math, I was reminded, and I said, it was, it was like the Lord was like, and praise God that you don't have to do that. Because there are uh, people in our church that manage that. And I am so, so thankful for Todd Harrelson, who manages the cleaning uh, volunteers. Yes, seriously, guys. Uh, Nancy, Roy, who oversee the, the, the cafe, have been fantastic. Uh, Daryl Wilson. Daryl Wilson, Mike O'Keefe, and th there's, there's a lot of you guys. Um, Mike Rocha, who have uh, come in and helped me with the facilities. Uh, for the last handful of weeks, some of the ladies going to the ladies' Bible study have seen uh, Daryl and I on our hands and knees praying, yes, but uh, mainly fixing the tile that have become trip hazards and things like that. And so huge thank you to all you guys, and I'm sure I have missed names. I'm sure I have. But it's, it's those, uh, those individuals that have volunteered their time that have come in. And, and when John talks about uh, sharing the load and bearing the burden of this facility, that's what we're talking about. Um, for the remainder of the year, uh, I'm not downgrading myself, but somewhat kind of downgrading myself into where I'm kind of shedding some of the uh, uh, executive pastor roles and stepping more into a facilities uh, manager role as well as worship leader and things like that because there's a lot to do there's there, there really is a lot to do there's cracks in drywall to to be replaced there's electrical things that we need to to fix there are still more broken tile uh, unfortunately that need to be uh, be <clears throat> they just go through puberty right before your eyes um, uh, there's more tile that need to be pulled up and replaced. And, and, and there's lots of different areas that, that we need help with. Um, we're gonna do just a quick example of, of, a, uh, of something that, is, that actually is a need. Alex, can we bring the house lights? Can we dim them real quick? I just wanna give you a visual representation right there, perfect. All right, do you guys see these lights that are above you guys? A lot of you have questioned, why do we have the lights off during worship? Can we just like bring them up a little bit? This is why. It's because the motherboard on our, on our sanctuary lights just went out and now that needs to be replaced. However, that company doesn't exist anymore. Woo, all right. All right, you can bring the lights back up. Uh, just this morning, uh, our this projector over here, you guys probably noticed that this projector's not working. This projector just died. Woo! All right, here we go. Uh, so, so there are lots of things for us to, uh, to maintain. And something that John and I were talking about last night when we were meeting about this is we're okay with maintaining a church for a season, but that's not all we want to do. We don't want to just maintain because the more time that we spend 
maintaining a building is less time that we have to devote to going out, fun, not, not just funding outreaches, but managing outreaches and being a part of the community. There are things going on in our community we have no idea. The, the heartbreak and the troubles and the, and the things that are going on in our community. So our, our goal really moving forward is to have a better uh, pulse on, on what's going on in the community, how we can uh, help shape the community for the gospel and for, and, and for Jesus. Um, I think it's Timothy Keller who just recently passed away. He said, uh, if your church disappeared tomorrow, would your community notice? And that quote haunts me every single day I show up to church. If we were to just like close our doors tomorrow, would our community notice? And praise God, I think, I think our community would, but I want to do more. I want to be able to focus on all of, all of the things that, that, that our community needs. Um, there's, there's plenty of volunteer opportunities for us to, to, to be a part of. Uh, our cleaning crew still needs more, more opportunities for, or more volunteers for, for a cleaning crew. We, uh, volunteers for a uh, cafe would be fantastic. Uh, there's lots of different areas. And so if you are a children's, oh my gosh, don't even get me started on children's ministry. Children's ministry needs volunteers like Stop producing all kids. Well, I mean, <laughs> producing kids grows a church very organically. It, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, but uh, we, we definitely need more uh, children's ministry volunteers. I believe in the, in the infants and, and younger kids, we need uh, volunteers for them. So if you guys uh, feel, that, feel that prick in your heart, answer it. That's, that's most likely the Lord. Some of the greatest opportunities are, are being able to teach our kids. I know that uh, Judah is looking for um, some, some uh, high school and junior high volunteers uh, to be able to help, help out with them. So um, I think that's it for my part. Your turn, Gavin. My turn. So can we throw on slide one? Can we get that up on the screen? Slide one. So looking at those numbers there for our 2024 preliminary budget, I want you to look at that facilities number, that 33%. So yes, it, it looks like a large number, but Adam just talked about how large of a church this facility actually is. We've discussed, we've done our due diligence and said, hey, what does this look like? What does this look like if we, oh, sorry, raise the mic. Uh, what do we look like if we downsize the church? If we move the church to another location, if we get a new building, what do, what do all of these options look like? And where we're at is with our current situation with an interest rate of three and a half percent, with a building that's this large, even if we sold it, to buy something of the same size would cost us three to four times more if we go on the open market. If we split this building and we say, you know what, we sell it, we take the cash, we buy something half the size, Buildings half the size within five miles of here, it doesn't exist. If we find that and that did exist, it ends up being almost the same cost of the worth of this building because of the special purpose of what the building is used for. So ultimately, looking at facilities, call it a $1.8 million mortgage for a building at 3.5%, we're in a great position. Now, I know that number looks large and looking at the budget, we looked and said, okay, is there anything that can be eliminated from this? There really isn't anything that can be eliminated from this. And to go out and make a decision to move is not the current answer. So I did want to let you know that that is that's something we looked at. We looked at, is this building too large for us? Is it too hard to manage? It is being managed, I mean, more volunteers would help decrease the load of managing it, but fiscally, it doesn't make sense for us to leave this building. And to add on to that, if you look in the commercial market, if you decide that you don't own but you lease or rent, um, a building of 
this size would well cost over $800,000 a year just to rent. Even half that size would be 400000 and that doesn't include your operating expenses um, you take into account. Right now, this building is about $3.35 a square foot. The going market for a triple net is at six, like $6.78, um, and keep in mind that triple net does not include in-house cleaning and maintenance in-house. Um, so when you look at that, it doesn't make sense to lease. Plus, we would forego our property tax exemption, which is huge. So every year, um, we are filing an exemption with Jefferson County and the state to receive our exemption, um, validating and certifying all the ministries that are coming out of this church. And I think it's important to know we're close to 40 different ministries, broadly speaking. And within those ministries, there's many ministries that go out of there. Um, but that exemption is close to $300,000 a year that we receive from the state of Colorado for property tax. If we were to lease, that exemption would go away because the property owner is typically not exempt from property tax. Um, the other thing, just to kind of cover facilities a little bit, I think it's important to know this is God's house. And in God's house, Every week, there's well over 800 people that come through this house, from Bible studies to coffee shop to food bank, where last year alone, 26,000 meals came out of this church. Um, so there's so much. God's doing amazing work. Um, working with Gavin and Adam and John and Christopher, we are constantly looking at ways to minimize costs, renegotiate contracts, uh, my job, obviously, is broad and wide. Uh, my background is commercial real estate. And with that said, um, we are working diligently to save every penny and to put it back into ministry. So taking this budget that Gavin just talked about, basically we're sh shaving off $100,000 in order to uh, meet uh, the giving. And it's challenging, but we also know that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So um, I don't know if you want to add to that or if we want to go into that. Yeah, I, I, I think the bigger point for you guys to understand is praise God we're in this facility. Praise God we have a tax-exempt status so that we don't pay property taxes. Um, and praise God that we are in a, a place where it's one of those overwhelming feelings like this is too much. And at the same time, like Gavin was saying, if we went anywhere else, we would be even it would be even harder. I believe, call me crazy, that God is going to not only provide for us as a church, I think the reason why he doesn't want us to move because I think we need a building to support the work he's gonna do. And I really believe that we're gonna see exponential growth as a church in response to the gospel message. And if th this is God's way of causing us to not be able to move because please understand I've reached out to multiple multiple churches to see if we can do a building swap and it has not worked at all I have physically gone to these churches to try to meet with the pastor and they will not meet with me and I am not intimidating looking well I, I mean we've, we we both showed up in your truck and we just kind of sat there we were waiting like for somebody to walk by and we're like uh, hey you and they're like it, can I help you something creepy, we're so. pastors don't worry <laughs> Just it seems like every effort to try to get out of here, God is not allowing. And if that means that we're here so that God can allow us to continue the work, praise be unto God. And if that means for whatever reason, because our debt-free 2023 campaign happened right before the world shut down and COVID happened, remember that? I do. Anyways, um, I don't know. If, to me, it's like if there's a means for us to pay off our building, and we don't have a mortgage anymore, and we redirect now every penny to ministry so that we can increase missions by 4% per year. I don't know what else excites me except to be generous with what we have, but to be faithful stewards also. We can't spend money we don't have, and just like you, you have to look at your finances and say, what needs to be cut out? And we had a very long, agonizing meeting to cut out over $100,000, which is about 14% of the budget. 
And guess what? It's going to be okay. And we're going to, we, we trust that God is going to do a work. But as of now, just to give you guys a heads up for 2024, when it comes to family um, feasts and outpour and, any, and VBS and all, basically ministries that we fund, we are not going to be able to do it. Primarily because we have, like I said, the tithe has to support the operation costs as a church. And I haven't had to do this yet, but it's one of those, like, we're the skeleton crew right now. And the thought of having to let go of another person is just, I'm, I, I can't think about it, guys. I don't think this is the end for us. In fact, I look at this as an opportunity for us as a church to seek him in prayer and almost, all right, Lord, you own cattle on a thousand hills and money is not a problem. Really, the priority of what I want to focus on is the gospel, Lord. So help us to just be good stewards with what we have. And if we're faithful in the small things, then he'll make us rulers over many things. I just want you guys to know that every penny you give to the church is considered and prayed over and with the board of directors is approved so that we can do church. You're not going to go in the back and find golden toilets like, that's where the tithe is going, Joel Stein. Just kidding. It's in the walls. It's in the walls, that's right. But at the end of the day, you just smile and people forget about it. Sorry. No, you're not. Adam at calvarycsd.org if you had a problem with that comment. If, if, if I can add one thing, I think some of the things that the Lord has been reminding me of lately, I, I know I'm, I, the Lord has been reminding me of the simple truths that we can hold on to. And here's some simple truths for us all to hold on to. Number one, God loves his church. Amen. We're his bride. Like, why would he not provide for it? I mean, like, there, there's so many, there's so much gosh, near I say, the entirety of scripture is all about God drawing near to his people, doing everything that he can to be near his people. The setting up of the tabernacle, you know, the, 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 the calling back to the promised land, the, all of these things are for his people to be, to be near to him. And he's doing this work. He loves you guys. He's not done with CSD. I could say that 100%. I really feel confident. The Lord is not done. The Lord is doing a new thing. The Lord is, ex we, are, we are excited to see what the Lord is doing. And if I can uh, maybe direct our prayers a little bit, here's what I want to pray. The Lord, the Lord asked me this question. If CSD was to not grow numerically ever again, would you be okay with it? And I was like, Lord, under one condition, that it would grow only by new converts. That, that's, where, that, that's where I want to grow. I want to grow by seeing people that are coming to faith, coming into our church. I don't like sheep shifting. People that just, oh, we don't like this church, so we're just coming to here. Sometimes it's appropriate. Sometimes. But... For the most part, I really want to point our prayers that the Lord would start bringing new converts to our church. I, I, that, that's how I want to grow. That's how I want to, I want to see the Lord move. We have a lot of ways to um, present what we're talking about to the Lord. And before we break off in prayer, um, I know that... Yep, there it is. My brain just melted for a second. Um, for those of you that just understand, like, what does this mean for me practically? What does this mean for me financially? Uh, obviously, for us, uh, we're making budgetary changes at the Dracy home to support the cost of the Dracy home in the same way we're doing at the church. And, you know, for Carolyn and I, this is a really sweet season to trust in the Lord more. And we're, it's just... Sometimes these things have to happen to force you on your face in times where you wouldn't be forced on your face. And it means working a little extra harder. So not to toot any extra horns, please understand that we're not asking you to give above and beyond and not 
and that we're doing nothing about it. Um, between Carolyn and I, we trust in the Lord with our finances. We've been married for 18 years next month. And for us, it's been important to be debt free. And that's come at a very difficult and painstaking slow process. Uh, but for Carolyn and I, we do what we call in the ministry side hustling. I know that sounds really sketch, but um, <laughs> totally legal, totally legal. Um, but you know, the reality is just like the Dracy household has to support operation costs, we, we work second part-time jobs. And this is, a, I, I'm pointing this out so that you understand that I would never ask the church to go above and beyond and pray about this if we are not doing it. And we are, because we trust that God's gonna provide and he still has. I mean, I have a roof over my head still, my kids are getting uh, an education and, and God's good. Um, so I, I, I wanna end with one more thing, unless Gavin, you wanna say something before. Um, some of you know that we have certain giving options here at the church. And Deb, I don't know if you wanted to talk about some of those distributing, distributing options that the church may or may not be aware of uh, with giving. Uh, and then this would give them the opportunity to know. Yes, there's a, a variety of giving op options. We can take stocks, bonds, uh, IRA distributions, crypto, real estate, even beneficiaries on life insurance policies, which that's kind of a, I don't like actually saying that, but sorry. <laughs> um, and those are different ways that you can give, and we have different platforms to receive those gifts in the church's name. And if you're a recurring uh, giver, we thank you very, very much for that. That comes in weekly, monthly, semi-monthly, quarterly. And then we have our uh, weekly givers or occasional givers, so there's uh, through push pay. So IRA, stock, cryptocurrency, we are not accepting used couches. Please do not no. donate your Goodwill used couches. Goodwill. Yeah, Goodwill doesn't take it anymore. Goodwill Did you guys Goodwill know Goodwill that? Take couches. The only couches. good thing that came from COVID. Sorry, I'm gonna get canceled. Anyways, um, I am gonna get in trouble. Um, we're going to end with prayer, but one of the reasons why we're having this meeting is so that you understand that with our refi and then redirecting some of the operation costs to do work on the facility, we've had to redirect a lot of those costs to general operations because we're at a $100,000 deficit. And we still have money in the bank and we're still trusting the Lord through the process, but this is why we're making this decision now. We can't operate this way for 2024, which is why we've made numerical changes in order to support it. So this isn't a doctor's visit, cancer diagnosis, this is how you're slowly gonna die. This is, all right, we have to make changes and you know what, we're gonna trust in the Lord because at the end of the day, this is his church, amen? And at the end of the day, we're gonna fulfill the, the great commission, we're gonna make time and manage time and give our time back to the Lord because at the end of the day, how, how great would that be is that we're having this family meeting and then Jesus returns tonight and it's all irrelevant. <laughs> you know what I mean? How amazing would that be? I just, I, just, I just want to take the time we have so that when I stand before the Lord, he, I can say, I used every second I could, Lord, to honor you. And would you forgive me for the things that, that distracted me from the things that you had before me? I don't want to be distracted anymore. I, I just want to see the Lord to a powerful work, amen? Okay, this is what we're gonna do because um, we have 15 minutes and, oh, Gavin, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, actually, go ahead. Hey, Levi, can you throw up slide one for us? So this is a look at the preliminary budget going into next year. So I wanna let you know that Adam and Chris and Deb have worked on this, I mean, for the last two months, they have dug deep into each individual ministry. Adam called me, we met up a couple times to look at hard numbers, and we looked at numbers for every individual cat or category that shows up on our general ledger. Out of the six, 700 pages of general ledger, we looked at every single dollar that came in, how every dollar went out, and where can we adjust from there. When I first saw the budget going in and where we could make cuts, I 100% looking at the budget thought, where do we go so that no staff member has to lose their job? 
So if that means it has to be moving $100 out of a ministry that wasn't really necessary at that point, it got moved. Did we make hard cuts going into it? Yeah, we made a lot of hard cuts. VBS being one of those. Um, food for doing outpour. There's a lot of numbers that we had to strip out to get to this preliminary budget going into the next year. Now know that this is still preliminary. We still look at this and by the end of the year we vote on it as a board as we approve the budget going into the next year. But we want you to see where dollars that come in, where tithes that come in, where it's gonna be going um, going into next year. So if you just look at that, that pie graph there, you'll be able to see that staff and facilities makes up the vast majority of that budget. I mean, it's 90% roughly goes into staff facilities which by the way we provide uh, health insurance for our, our staff so that our families can be taken care of mm -hmm. and we every year evaluate and let the board determine who's you know the, the pay that everyone gets and so Everything, if you've ever wondered, how is this church governed? I mean, is John just like in the back, like shirtless, like riding a horse and be like, do what I say? That would be really funny to imagine. Anyways, um, no, I, I have accountability and I can't just unilaterally make any decision I want. Praise God, because as most of you know, church history, people who have done that, it doesn't end well. I have to answer before God, just like all of you, and I want to be able to manage what God has entrusted to me to the best of my ability. Um, I think we should end with some prayer. And, oh, go ahead. Yeah. One thing that um, we didn't touch on, um, but one of the other things that we're doing is when you arrive at this site, we have four different owners that, including us, that we work with to manage this site. And CSD took control of that two years ago two years ago, because we're the majority owner of this site at 49%. And with that said, um, I think it's important that you guys also know how hard we worked on the parking lot where you had what was going to be about a $800,000 project, and which we would have uh, had to pay 49% of that. And when we could, could, took control of it, we were able to competitively bid everything, work closely with a contractor, and it saved us well over $230,000. And so the benefit of that too is the other owners got that benefit. We were able to forego the 10% manager's director's fees because we handled it all in-house with uh, CSD. Technically, we should have gotten paid that because we did the whole project, but we were a blessing to our other owners. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Just to let everyone know, uh, that was because a Deb took that on herself. So I think 100%. it's only appropriate we thank Deb, because she's never going to say it. Which is why in a post-apocalyptic world, she's the gang leader, not me. Find I go to her. Deb. She's from Montana. She comes across as sweet and innocent. She will cut me at a great cost. Which is why she's my leader in, in a post-apocalyptic world. All right, can, can we end with prayer? Let's do this. Let's, um, um, Adam, why don't you get the guitar and let's end with prayer corporately and then Adam can play quietly in the background and I, I know we have like less than 10 minutes, so let's just do this. Can, can we do that? Can I just start us off with prayer and can we just in groups where you're at, you can be one, just whoever you're with, just can we just pray and bring these requests to the Lord? Because it's one thing to be like, here's our need, but we're not going to seek you, Lord. It's like, you know what? Let's bring this to the Lord. Does that sound like a good idea? Ooh.